Hi, I want to thank, thank you all for coming and thank you for staying. The, um, we're going to be talking, as Spencer said, about trust and security and, the, and some issues related, but we've only got 30 minutes. So I'm going to be talking to Andrew Rubin, who's the founder and CEO of Illumio, and Mike Lemberger, who's Senior Vice President for European Products and Solutions of Visa, uh, both of whom have thought about these issues a lot. We're going to divide the conversation into two basic parts. First of all, aware that a lot of people are from startups, we want to talk about the question of trust and confidence as it affects startups. We are in a moment that is a moment of huge crisis for confidence across the board, in politics, in money, and all of it is a crisis that's related in one way or another to uh, information technology and to the internet and online issues. The second part of the discussion is going to be basically about the apocalypse. We're going to look at an issue that a lot of people in the industry are focusing on, but maybe not enough people are focusing on, which is the whole question of breaches of alteration. But we'll get to that in a minute. First, let's talk about startups and the whole question of trust. You know, Andrew, you and I have talked about this a little bit. What is important for startups to know about the question of confidence and trust in today's world, given that a lot of the big guys have made big mistakes and a lot of issues have come up about how much we can trust anybody with any of the information we give them? I think there's a fundamental difference in where the world is today versus where it was 10 years ago and certainly further back for a startup. And it, it, it starts with the attack surface. In other words, in the past, if a big company made a big mistake, lots of people were going to see it. If a small company made a small or a big mistake, very few people would probably know about it. But when you put the internet and social media and the ability to effectively broadcast just about anything in real time out to a very large group of people, it means that a startup, even a startup with only 20 people, can actually make a mistake, have a breach, and all of a sudden, millions of people literally can see it. And I think that that's a fundamental shift in the way that startups have to think about the trust issue. From day one, you are effectively broadcasting potentially to the world, maybe even before you have a product, maybe before you even have revenue. And I think that that's probably the change that most startups haven't fully adapted to yet. Yeah, Mike, we were talking about this a little bit because there's also the interface between the startups and the big guys. Uh, you work with a lot of startups. How do you know you can have confidence in them? How do you build confidence with them? Yeah, and I think, uh you know, taking the cue from a lot of the tech giants that are out there, and, and Visa similarly is a, is a very large fintech, uh, we've looked at this and figured out how can we best address this as well, and I think this is kind of happening for the larger areas. Um, we feel like it's our responsibility to set up the environments, um, sandboxes, places that they can come and put their data, put their information in secure environments, interact with small, large, financial, healthcare, other types of institutions, know that they can build in a protective way to start because they, they have to think about that in the very beginning. And then once they do that, they can build the confidence. And we, as the larger institutions who invest maybe more money than a startup might have in some of those securities can start to teach as well. So I think it's a, it's a both way. You know, it's creating the environments so they can welcome them in and then teaching as well about the security and the information as we set the protocols across the, the platforms. Is there is there anything that startups can do? Have you seen anything that startups are doing that is going to encourage people to feel more confident overall in the, in the field of information technology? I'm sure there are things that are being done, and I don't want to catch you uh, a wrong foot you on this. I just wonder if you've seen anything like that, have any examples in mind? Yeah, I mean, I think along the lines of, uh, you know, consumers are still you know, interested in content and information. So they are willing to kind of share uh, data to get that content and information. I think that will still remain true. Um, if we think about the fact that, um, you, know, you know, consent and understanding how we control consent, how we store that information, and actually how we have the ability to track that, 
is the things we're starting to see. I mean, I think some of the new regulations that we're starting to see that says, I can then you know, quickly understand who has my data and who doesn't have my data, um, and that as long as people follow some of the protocols that are out there, um, we'll start to build further trust within the environments. And you know, everybody uh, you know, I I across the industry needs to kind of follow those standards. And to do agree, we need to self-police. That hasn't, we haven't seen that yet, as a lot of this is kind of playing out. But I think that'll be what the, the future will hold in some of this. Andrew? I'll give you an example. So at Illumio, we're about a 300-person company. I still think of us very much as a startup or an early-stage company. And we use cloud services. I'm sure that there are many early-stage companies at Viva Tech that are using cloud services. You subscribe to them now. They're a replacement for all of the things that we used to have to buy and run on our own. It is true that in most cases, all of us collectively have no idea about the security posture of all of these SaaS and cloud services that we're using. Because many of these services that we're subscribing to are also startups. And so one of the things that we think a lot about is when we decide to put some of our data in some SaaS service, and it's an early stage company, we want to ask them the questions about whether or not they're secure. We want to understand how seriously they're taking security. Now the counterbalance to that is every breach that we've all read about on the front page of a newspaper hasn't been about a startup. It's been about a very large, very established, multi-billion dollar company. And so if they are capable of getting it wrong, we should assume anybody could. But it doesn't mean that you don't have the hygiene to ask the questions and to think about the issue seriously from the very beginning. Yeah, moving along to the apocalypse, the, one of the things that we were talking about, Mike and I were talking about in the green room, you and I have talked about it before, is this whole question of a breach of alteration. Now, we all know about hacking that is meant to steal data, to steal money. We know about hacking that's made to carry out extortion rackets. If you don't pay us, we're going to do this or that to you. But there's a kind of hacking that's becoming a little bit more common, but could get a lot more common, that in some ways is much scarier. And that's the kind of hacking that is meant to attack, specifically attack confidence, attack trust in a system by getting into a system and starting to change data. Now, there's one famous example of this that maybe everybody remembers from a few years ago, but that was a, a huge operation where the United States and Israel developed a worm that got into the Iranian nuclear system and caused the centrifuges enriching uranium to run very badly and start to break down. And it took months and months and months before anybody in Iran could figure out what the hell was happening. Nobody claimed credit for it. Still nobody's claimed credit for it. Nobody knew exactly how it was happening until the worm was exposed. That's just one example of a very high-tech version. It could happen in a lot of different industries, a lot of different environments. And I want to ask Andrew first, you've given this a lot of thought, not about Stuxnet, but about much different kinds of uh, alterations. What are some of the scenarios that you worry about? Well, I think. I think at the core of it, all of the big breaches that you've read about, and I don't need to list the names because we've all read about them or seen about them on TV even recently, all the big breaches that we've read about and seen have really been about exfiltration. It's about somebody breaking in to steal your information. Um, it's happened to me a number of times. Usually it results in a new credit card showing up in the mail from your bank, or if you have sensitive information with a provider, maybe you get a letter saying, here's what happened, and we're going to protect your identity for the next two years for free. But this is always about exfiltrating the data. The really scary scenario, and apocalyptic may be right, we don't know, we haven't seen it yet, thank goodness, but everybody certainly in my side of the industry feels like it's inevitable, is the breach of alteration. Because if you think about it, we're running our entire lives on tech, all stop. There is no way out of this. We've created it, we now live on it. It doesn't matter what you do for a living, where in the world you live, we are running everything. If you need evidence of it, pull the phone out of your pocket, your entire life from your bank account to every photo of your friends, your spouse, or your children is sitting inside of your pocket. And as a result of that, the breach that we haven't experienced is the breach of alteration where somebody decides not that they're gonna steal that information, but where they're gonna change it. And the example, of course, that everybody immediately goes to, because it's easy and you can imagine it happening to you, it's not some far off example is, 
What happened if tomorrow morning you woke up and you logged into your bank account and all the money wasn't gone, it didn't show zero. You'd actually assume that that was a technical problem that the bank was having. But what happened if it was just different? And of course it was different for less, not different for more. More you would celebrate and not tell anybody about it. But if it was less, you would in an instant realize that you actually have no idea what to do. You can take the card, the debit card out of your pocket and call the 800 number, but imagine this conversation playing out. You call the bank telephone number and say the following. So I logged into my account and there's money missing. Could you imagine the operator on the other end of the phone saying, well, that sounds fine. We'll just put it back for you right now. We'll give you money because we trust you. What you would realize very quickly is not only would your trust in that institution be eviscerated immediately, but what's even worse is there's no way to fix it. The operator is not going to just put the money back in your account, I assure you. There isn't really a playbook for what happens in this scenario. And of course, if it happens to one person, it's not apocalyptic. But what happens if it happened to 30 million people in Europe all on the same day? And so you can start to imagine that you not only have the problem of the breach itself, but you are talking about a massive crisis of confidence unlike anything that we've experienced. And in case you're wondering how fast the news will travel, think about how long it takes a tweet from somebody famous or important to travel the world nowadays. Because as soon as a few people realize that the money's missing from their bank account, the first thing they're gonna do when they can't get it back is they're gonna go to Facebook or they're gonna go to Twitter or they're gonna go to social media and they're gonna post, hey, this happened to me. Is it happening to anyone else? What are you doing? And you will have a massive crisis of confidence that we have not seen before. Mike, I know this is something you're worried about at Visa. Yeah, if we think about this, and as we head to this era of machine learning and, and thinking about the algorithms and understanding different components of data, um, certainly within our environments, one of the things that the many people trust about Visa and our brand is our ability to keep things safe and secure. Um, we have you know, thousands and thousands of data points running against a fraud algorithm uh, to make sure that things are um, uh, are going through and we don't wind up with some of those types of breaches or wrong wrong amounts being put into accounts. But what if people started to infiltrate just small amounts of data that actually taught the machines to learn the wrong way instead of the right way, and then they did that for a period of time, and then they knew that then they were guiding actually how machines understood things. And if you don't have the proper checkpoints from a human in a sense, right, you start to run down a path that before too long, you're extracting small amounts of money or small amounts of data. And at that point, you realize, wait a minute, uh, our algorithms were running great, actually. They were getting all the right scores, but the input data was wrong. And that really is the kind of a, the, the fear that um, it's a slow burn instead of the, hey, I, I got a whole bunch of financial services data or a whole bunch of personal data about who your, you know, your, your, your date of birth or other things and, and then sold that off. So we, we've got to be careful here and, and make sure that we kind of understand that and certainly put the right tools in place to kind of protect it. And you know, this is where some of the human part will still need to come back into this and we'll need to make sure that we check on this and make sure that we're, uh, we're aware that the apocalypse uh, never comes. Well, the reason, the reason I was using the apocalyptic uh, phrase is, or word, is because we actually live in an era where there are malign actors who have set out to destroy confidence, including in the American political system and other political systems. Uh, and I think one of the questions you have to ask yourself about the scenarios that both of you are painting is if it's not going to be for extortion, if it's not going to be for theft, then what would motivate an actor to do this, someone to do this to Visa or to the bank or to a pharmaceutical company by changing the formulas of, uh, of Vixedrin or whatever? Uh, what would motivate them to do that? Now, this is sort of hy very hypothetical, but I wonder if there's not a little complacency because people can't imagine who would want to do this if it didn't pay off for them in dollars and cents. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I mean, look, w with anything in the world, right, there's different agendas that, that sit across, you know, different borders or, or different philosophies. And some of that stuff uh, can lead to you know, desperation in some areas. And some of that's led to, you know, a certain amount of people not having access to things and, and holding a vendetta against people that do have access to certain things. And then they come across a way that they may be able to find uh, to get attention to it and what's there. Some of it may start as, a, as an innocent component of wanting to draw attention to a cause. 
and it kind of gets out of control and to the point where it wasn't malintent in the beginning. It was more of, hey, I want to make sure that people are aware of certain levels of poverty or certain levels of, of environmental protection and the unintended consequences were that they wound up kind of exposing or putting information out that wasn't quite right. And then all of a sudden it ruins brands, it ruins jobs, it ruins communities. And at that point it was, once again, the malice wasn't there in a sense that we may think, but the unintended consequences there is, and then it's too late, right? And now all of a sudden a town has shut down a factory because the brand is no longer able to sustain itself um, because of a cause somewhere else or something that was looked at. And so we have to be careful to think about that from an ecosystem balance as well. So well, I think at the end of the day, the motivation typically in any kind of criminal act has always come back to one of two things when you trace it all the way back to the root cause. It's either money or it's an agenda. Political could be one version of an agenda, but it's not the only one. And unfortunately, when it comes to altering data, you can get to either one of those two root causes very quickly. So if you cause a commercial entity to have a crisis of confidence, it's probably a reasonable assumption that the stock is going to go in a certain direction you can very quickly build a model that shows exactly how you could take advantage of a crisis of confidence over here to make money over there. In other words, it usually comes back to one of two things, and what alteration does is it puts a massive magnifying glass on trust. Trust is sort of a commodity, and for a very long time, we all believed that it was inherently there. You sort of found it like water or air. Trust is becoming a scarcer and scarcer commodity, the value of it is going up, just like it does in the real world. People look at a diamond and they look at something else and they say that's more valuable because it's more scarce, because people have perceived it to be more special. Trust is now becoming like that diamond. And so what's happening is, if you're in a position to alter data or alter the story around that data, which is really what happens, you have the ability to use that as a way to get to either one of those two root causes. Um, you can imagine that there's literally unlimited scenarios in which you could push an agenda if you had the ability to alter trust. We've seen some of them play out already. Well, this could get into a philosophical question of what is trust and what is truth. I'm not sure we're going to go down that road. But going forward, how can companies be given what used to be called the good housekeeping seal of approval? How can they be uh, portray themselves in a way that people know that they are trustworthy, that they can have confidence, that there, no breach of alteration is going to happen, that these things are not going to happen. I mean, I think, uh, Mike, you explained it well for, for Visa, how all the work that you're doing. But do, are people aware of all the work you're doing? Is there some way to show that off? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think you know, one of the things that Visa did, and amazingly, it was, it was three years ago when we announced our developer center and developer platform for the first you know, 50 years of Visa, we had a, we had a closed environment. It was, it was very hidden behind closed doors. Um, we didn't let anybody in. We were very worried about the security and the information that we carried. Um, three years ago, we opened up this developer platform. We invited people in. We've now been spending a lot of time within the community and the financial community um, and, and the startup community saying, come in, make sure the fintechs are aware. We've opened up uh, fintech hubs. We've opened up innovation centers across Europe and around the world to be able to make sure people are aware that uh, we want to share what we've done. And as I kind of alluded to before, um, there's a lot to learn from those things. And I mentioned before around the kind of self-policing within this. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that we're doing is, is that we're trying to set up those communities to do that type of stuff, which is um, we're connected to lots of financial institutions around the world. Um, we can share messages very quickly. A lot of the startups that we meet with uh, want to be able to kind of take advantage not only of uh, the technology that we have, but the confidence that we exude as, as part of that. And so I think the brands that are uh, have that confidence that, that the consumers, whether they be B2B brands or B2C brands, um, need to take that response responsibility to kind of help set examples uh, as we move forward. So if you think about all the big breaches that you've seen in the last couple of years, what's the one thing, what's the one consistent theme that has nothing to do with technology that you could argue almost every one of these organizations has fallen down on? It's communication every single time. It's literally the deer in the headlights when the news breaks and it's never the company walking up to the podium and saying, this is what happened, we're on top of it, this is what we're doing about it. Even though we have breached your trust, this is what we're gonna to do to rebuild it. It usually is the news story breaking and then the company trying to figure out how to respond. And so what's interesting is, as I spend time in my day job, 
with many large organizations that are customers of Illumio, and they say to me, what's the number one thing we should be thinking about in terms of cybersecurity and trust? The first thing I say is, what is going to happen the day you get breached? What's your plan for communicating with your customers? How are you gonna to talk to them? What are you gonna tell them? Because at that moment, if you are not leading that conversation, someone else is gonna lead it for you, and they're probably gonna do it in a way that you don't like, and your customers are going to be very unhappy with. And so I think the difference for an early stage company is that we're having to confront that same conversation now, whereas we would have pushed it off 10 years down the road. We would have said if we're a visa one day, if we're lucky enough to grow up, we'll probably have to think about that. But now, even in the earliest days, you have to worry about the exposure of what happens when something goes wrong. And so even thinking about what does the day of the breach look like becomes part of that conversation, apocalyptic or not. <laughs> You know, uh, when I first started looking at technology at all, the whole idea of security was firewalls. We're going to build firewalls and keep people out. Are we going to give up on firewalls? How does, that, how does that work now in terms of security, in terms of especially when we're talking about something as insidious as a breach of alteration? Well, staying very far away from the technical speak, what I would say is this. If you think about your home, your apartment, even your office, you probably have a lock on the front door. It's probably not the only thing that you do to secure the place, especially if it's an office building, let's say. If you go to a large office building, there's not just a lock on the front door, there's probably a security guard at the front desk. There's probably an alarm system. There's probably cameras. And they have all these layers that they've put in place for one very simple reason. They don't trust entirely any one of them and especially not the lock on the front door. So in the technology world, all that data that we've all created that sits in these data centers and these clouds that we hear about, the way that we kept it safe for decades was we put a lock on the front door. Over the last few years, we've all seen and read enough about our data walking out of the building that we no longer believe that the lock alone is enough. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing this market transition, this philo philosophical transition to saying, I'm still gonna put the lock on the front door. It seems crazy to take it off altogether, but I'm not going to entrust the lock 100% with my security. And so I'm gonna build other defenses. I'm gonna do other things to protect this data and make sure that it isn't accessed in ways that it's not supposed to or altered in ways that it shouldn't be. And of course, there is no silver bullet. There is no single thing that's gonna happen that's gonna make all this go away but the theory that we trust simple lock on a simple front door to keep everything safe is probably dead in the rearview mirror. I want to thank you both. I think we've heard some great ideas here about the threats that exist and also some of the things that can be done to answer them. And I hope people take them to heart because you think apocalypse is too big a word for this. I don't. I think we are in an era when trust and truth and the whole idea of what truth is have been systematically eroded by events and by people. And if that continues, we're going to be at sea in a world where everything is speculation and guesswork and nothing is fact. And as a journalist, I hope that never happens. And I want to thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Hold. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hold. Guys. Um,